Thank you. Okay. Is that on? Is that uh, uh, press the green. I'm in the red, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Maybe by a quick uh, hand vote. So we, we did a little bit of an experiment last week. We kind of gave a, a, a project for people to do independently, but feel they're doing it as part of a group, this idea of thinking a little bit about the situation in Israel for a moment once a day before we got to the bracha of, of Re'e Von Yenu in Shemora Esrei. Uh, again, not to put anyone on the spot, but just was there uh, n nothing other than just raising your hand. Was there anyone who thought that was meaningful for them? Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I certainly found it very meaningful. Uh, it's funny, I always tell people one of the greatest things of being a rabbi is if you don't listen to some of your own advice, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> so, so I felt like, okay, I, you know, I have to do this. But, but, uh, but ironically, even though it was my own idea, there's no way I would have done it if, if, if I didn't think it was being done by others and like there was kind of a group of people doing it. And it's my own shortcoming. But um, um, does it make sense to suggest something additional for the next week, or it makes sense to just stick with this and think about it? Okay, so I just wanted to throw another thing. I, I, I honestly, uh, at least for myself, this idea of, uh, I, I, first of all, thinking about the situation in Israel before Rayvon Yenu, if nothing else, compels me to actively think about it at least once a day. Which, again, that's a terrible shortcoming that I need that, but. I'm probably not the only one who needs that. And, and it, it was a very, very powerful thing. Um, so I, 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 for myself, I found it very meaningful. Uh, just a totally different thing uh, to change gears. And I, do I don't mean this. Three times a day, do you not? What'd you say? Three times a day. Okay. Well, I, I have a cousin who's in the rabbinate who tells me, me and you are professional Jews. So I, 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 I do say Shemot Esrei three times a day. I, I tried to reflect on it three times a day. But I think there's something very practical about telling oneself a minimum of once. You know, in terms of reflecting on it. Um, not, not to replace that for anyone who's interested in participating, but just to give another thing, if people like the idea of doing something as a group. I, I don't know about anyone else. I, I was extremely moved. We discussed it last week. If we talk about the Shema, it makes sense to do something with the Shema. I was extremely moved by Rav Schwab's comment that we shared last week. But Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu Hashem Achad. That, that statement, one can think of oneself as... This is an affirmation in one's own personal life of the two commandments the Jewish people heard directly from God at Har Sinai. The two commandments heard directly from God at Har Sinai were, I am Hashem your God, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu, and the second commandment was, there's no other gods. Hashem Echad, God is the only one. And I, I personally think it would be very powerful to try, to try, to try once a day, to just before one says the Shema, to think about that for a moment, that my sitting here and saying the Shema is the continuation in our times of the Jewish people standing at our Sinai and hearing the Ten Commandments from God. I think there's something very powerful about that. Uh, and by the way, that speaks to our connection as a people too, and our, our, our connection with each other. So take it or leave it. Um, if you think it's a bad idea, no need to share it at this point. But uh, I don't know if uh, we'll see. You know, and I think to, to take on things as a group, I think is a powerful thing. Okay, um, we are still in the first paragraph of Shema. If you're in the Art Scroll English, one of the pages it's on is page 92. Um, generally speaking, the first paragraph of Shema is about recognizing, accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. But what's really striking in this first paragraph is it's very much a sense of Abba Hashem, very much a sense of love of God. Uh, that's the first word here, you know, after the Shema. You have to Hashem look at me, love Hashem your God. Uh, and really, this paragraph is very much about cultivating a relationship with God, a relationship built on gratitude, built on affection, and recognizing his affection for us. So thinking about it in that context, if you go on to the second verse here on page 92, These words that I command you today should be upon your heart. So, first of all, Rashi says, a really interesting thing, Rashi says, the sign that you truly are living a love of God. There's the previous possibility is you should love God. The sign that you're really living a life of loving God is if the commandments that he gives you are on your heart, are, are internalized within you. In other words, people talk a lot about loving God. And, and obviously, we can't, get to love of God if, if we don't have an emotional 
appreciation and things of that sort. But Rashi says he's defining for us part of how that love manifests itself to, 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 to devoutly follow the mitzvahs. And again, uh, there are many people out there who devoutly follow the mitzvahs who are not living with love of God because everything is by rote. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of, of lahabdal, lahabdal, lahabdal. You have um, a child who has great affection for uh, his or her parent. And they love their parent very, very much. And whenever you say their parent's name, they have a big smile on their face. And you ask the child, well, so what do you do for your parent's birthday? And the child says, well, I don't find that important. And uh, the, you say, well, I happen to know your, your mother, your father, and birthdays are very meaningful to them. I say, yeah, yeah, but it doesn't mean much to me. <laughs> so you would say there's something lacking in that loving relationship. I think you would say that. So no, it's, this, is, this is God's birthday present, that, 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 except it's more than one day a year. It's, it's uh, to, to have a significance for the mitzvahs. Um, there's a commentary called Say de la Derech, and he just gives a very interesting thing to think about in the specific wording in the verse. It says, these, these words which I command you today should be on your heart. So he says it means like engraved within your heart. You know, that, that a person lives the mitzvahs of Hashem with, with great passion. And, and, you know, we all have things that are sort of core to our being and then things that are a little more peripheral. That, that the mitzvahs of Hashem are core to our being. There's a very famous idea which Rashi cites also in this Pasuk, and this is a great challenge, but that we need to view the mitzvahs, the God's commandments, as being new things every day. That, that, you know, the same excitement that, uh, same excitement that one feels uh, when something is new and fresh, that's the goal. That, that each and every day we live that way. Um, okay. One more comment just on this verse. Rav Schwab says that one of the manifestations of loving God is the phrase, Asher hayom, that I command you today. That I believe that when God has the mitzvahs, God's talking to me. That, that, that I believe that. that. That I believe that when there's a constant saying Shema every day, He wants my Shema. Not heaven forbid the exclusion of others, but he's thinking of me too. And, and, and that, that, that's part of what it is to have an affectionate relationship with God. That, you know, whatever mitzvah you're thinking about, whatever mitzvah you're doing, this is, he has me in mind, among others, when he gives this mitzvah. Interesting. Okay, um, continuing to the next verse. V'shinan tam levonecha, you should teach these ideas to your children. V'dibar tabam. You should speak about these ideas. Uh, Rashi explains that the idea of you should speak about them is that this is the, the core of your speech, that your primary speech be about God's Torah and his mitzvot. Again, a very lofty plane, but at least something worthy of reflecting on. We can live that, by the way, even just when we get together with people to share a Torah thought. You know, you know, many of us do it, let's say, at the Shabbos table or something like that, but it's, it's, it's a powerful thing that when we have large gatherings, smaller gatherings, there should be a Torah thought somewhere in the context. Um, I always try to tuck a Torah thought somewhere into my sermons, but okay. Um, <laughs> most of the time I get there. When you sit in your home, and when you walk on the path. Just that it's interesting, someone who's not attending this, that's a, a young man in the show. I don't know why he was asking me just last week, but he was asking me last week, why does it say in the Pasuk, as you sit in your home. Let it, I mean, the next phrase is as you walk on the path. So, as, as, as you sit in, in, your, in the house. So, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is really the pshat, but I, I, I think there is a significance here. There's, this is more than just we should spend our time in a meaningful way. This is that we have a charge to make our homes special places. Specific, you know, this is uh, this is more than just try to learn and think about God wherever you are, which of course is true. I mean, that's being brought out in the passage, but I think there's another emphasis here that is a special charge that our homes have to be places of, of connection to God. I just want to get through a little bit more, if you don't mind. Uvelech chavaderech, as you walk on the path. Uvshach b'chav kumecha, when you lie down, when you get up. Uh, there's a very technical halacha learned from this phrase that has to do with the times for Kriya Shema. Uh, but on a basic level, uh, the idea is that at all times of life, a person should be thinking about God thinking about his mitzvahs, talking about his mitzvahs. And now, 
very, very interestingly, the Torah, in the context of forging this relationship with God, gives us um, two specific mitzvahs. Now, clearly, the reason why these mitzvahs are introduced is because these are mitzvahs they have to do with writing these psukim of the Shema. But it, it's still striking. Ukshar tam liyos ayodecha. should tie it as a sign on your, literally, your hand or your arm. Fayu totafos beinei necha. They should be these tefillin boxes between your eyes. The famous idea of the tefillin shel yad, the tefillin shel rosh. Uh, we could spend three weeks on this, but just on a very general level, the tefillin shel yad speaks to the fact that we devote our actions to God. This is something very powerful, by the way. We tie, we, 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 we fasten the box around our arm. In other words, we're, we're, our actions are bound by the will of God. And the tefillin shel rosh, over the head, that we devote our our thoughts, our, 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 our mental perspectives uh, to God. And then, you should write it on the doorposts of your, of your homes and your gates, the idea that as a person enters his or her home, as a person leaves his or her home, there's always the word of God as they, as they walk in and out uh, is, is, is an extremely powerful thing. And all of these things are, are intended to manifest a greater sense of acceptance of, of God in our lives, and specifically of a sense of affectionate relationship with God. I want to give a few minutes for questions or comments, and then Linda. Why doesn't it, that's the first thing that comes to mind, and then I'll ask you guys to Yeah, I think that's really a good point. Now, part of the, just to repeat the question, the question is, it, the, the conveying to the children, why is the conveying to the children rooted in teaching? Let the conveying to the children be rooted in, in, in doing and in modeling, let's say. Um, so I, I, I think there is a, a concept of action from the end of the, of, of the paragraph. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting. Part of the point seems to be the... <coughs> tremendous importance of, 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 of course, we always talk about how important modeling is, but actively, actively teaching our children Torah, how important, how important the study of Torah is to the, to the chain of the generations. I mean, that, that really, I mean, it's an interesting point. I, I, if, if I was writing it, I probably would have fully agreed with you, um, but, but this seems to be the lesson here. It seems to be the message that part of, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like the point seems to be that the Torah itself is really like the breath of our spiritual lives. In other words, the actions are, are what we do, but, but if, 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 we don't, if we don't convey a living, a living, breathing, vibrant Torah to our children, uh, it's hard to know how far the actions will go. I mean, that seems to be the message. It's a very interesting point, thank you for raising it. Sarah, did you? Yeah, well, how would you Who don't what? Don't put on children. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. um, but how would you help them to feel more connected with those works? Yeah. Um, a very a very fair point. Um, again, we could probably spend three months on that one. I mean, that's a um, on, on, on a very very general level. Um, I, I, first of all, I generally say Rav Hirsch has beautiful points that he makes in so many essays of, of the inherent spirituality of woman compared to man. Um, I, I mean, on, on, on a basic, basic level, I would frame it as these are actions that man has to do in order to focus himself so that his actions are, are appropriate, so that his thoughts are appropriate, and... Um, Actually, I would say that a woman reading this, uh, or a guy with a broken arm is not putting on the show yacht, <laughs> uh, re 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 reading this, um, uh, you know, would say that, that whether or not I have this mitzvah, the idea of devoting my actions and my thoughts to God is, is, is a core concept with the Shema. I, your question is better than my answer. Um, but, under this, but I, 
again, there's really two parts to what you're getting at, I think. One part to what you're getting at, and both are fair, is why, if it's so special, why wouldn't women have the mitzvah? I mean, that's, that's actually not really okay, but the secondary point is, assuming women don't have the mitzvah, so I just want to relate to it. So, again, I, I think the basic idea is the, this mitzvah is all about committing ourselves in, in deed and in mind to the will of God. And, and that is true in our lives, whether or not we specifically have the mitzvah of tefillin. Tefillin is, is a manifestation of that idea. I mean, that, that's, that's what I would say. Um, I'll take one more comment. Ara? I just wanted to add on to the question that you were asking earlier about why don't we role model? Why, why isn't that part of the teaching here? I was thinking that the word Tam is translated here as teach them thoroughly in the art school. Um, I think that's because the, the shorish there has to do with repetition. And, and review and review and review. So I think that word in itself, Shinam Tam, might suggest teach them in whatever way is necessary to have it inculcated thoroughly into their system. So it might include that. Great. Thank you very much. Shinam mean teeth? Shinam Tam? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, let's keep on going. Uh, so now we're on the second paragraph. The second paragraph, again, as we discussed last week, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is from now another section of the Torah. Uh, the, so the first section was for Parshas Bois Hanan, the second section for Parshas Ekev. And whereas the first paragraph was very much about acceptance of the yoke of heaven, the second paragraph is more about specifically accepting the mitzvahs upon ourselves, accepting God's commandments upon ourselves. Um, there's a very uh, somewhat, somewhat counterintuitive, to be honest with you, though maybe not so much so. Uh, if you would have asked me, what's the reason that we should do the mitzvahs, that we should be thinking about doing the mitzvahs? I don't know, I would say because it's so fulfilling, because it's the will of God. Uh, maybe I would say because that's what God said. Uh, some combination of those two. And uh, Shem goes in slightly a different direction, though not wholly a different direction. He says, you need to do it because I'll reward you. And uh, of course, it's a fascinating thing to think about that that's how God presents it. Um, presumably, God is presenting it as a motivator. Uh, we do well with motivation. I think that's fair. And obviously, the idea of a mitzvah is in keeping with a meaningful relationship with God, because that's really what we were talking about in the previous paragraph. Right? But now we present a whole different model, which is in addition to cultivating a meaningful relationship with God, th there are actually side benefits uh, to doing God's commandments, to keeping God's commandments. Now, we'll, we'll touch on it as we hit it in the psukim, but just as a general introduction, uh, this is of course a very difficult section of the Torah to understand because we know, we know, we could spend three years on this one, we know that not necessarily every righteous person has wonderful things in this world and we know that there are wicked people who seem to have it pretty good in this world too and yet God is presenting this as uh, as a general arrangement, <coughs> that if you do the mitzvot, good things will happen, if you do the mitzvot, bad things will happen. And for this, the Ramban famously explains that if you look in the verses, it's in the plural. And, and the idea is that this is if Klal Yisrael as a whole, the Jewish people as a whole, are really, really doing what they're supposed to be doing, then God assures us that we'll, we'll have great things happen. And if the Jewish people as a whole are really not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Then God assures us that heaven forbid bad things will happen. Um, that is not to say that if good things are happening, that means Jewish people as a whole are doing great and if bad things are... What it is to say is if the Jews are doing good things as a whole, good things will happen. Uh, the Rambam also says a very interesting thing, that this assurance in the verses is only for the outliers. It's only for when Klal Yisrael as a whole is acting with tremendous piety or when Klal Yisrael as a whole is acting with, uh, unfortunately, tr terrible wickedness. Um, but if we're somewhere in between, then we're left to God's regular way of dealing with the world. So this is a model, but it's, it's, it's not, uh, at least according to the Ramban, it's not a model that has constant application in, in our world. But it's, it's there, if that, if that made sense. Okay, I guess it did. Okay. Um, and it will be Im Shamoa Tishmuel Mitzvosai. If you listen to my commandments, Asher Anochim Mitzavaschem Hayom, that I command to you today, 
First of all, to love Hashem your God. And to serve Him. With all of your hearts and all of your souls. It's very interesting to see how many points we already made in the first paragraph repeat themselves here in this verse. Um, so first of all, similar to what we had in the first paragraph, there's an idea of my mitzvos that Rav Schwab says that a person should think to himself or herself that as they're doing mitzvah X, this is a moment where they're fulfilling the will of God. It's very interesting. There are, there are moments that, um, that we do things just because it's just intuitive. It just seems to be the right thing to do. And that's great. And that's fine. But, but it's interesting. It's, it's even more special if as we're doing the right things, we stop from it. We say, oh, you know, this is also a mitzvah, by the way. I'll give you a classic one. There's a mitzvah from the Torah that if a person does a service for you, you should pay him on that day. So it's just, it's just, uh, it's just interesting to, to think about. I, 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 I hired some young man to do something or another with my, with my son this past week, and I, you know, I was meeting him with my son, and I was paying him, and I thought to myself, as I'm giving him the check, I said, you know, I'm, I'm fulfilling a mitzvah right now. That, that's, that, that's like you know, one way of looking at things a little bit. Um, we have an idea of Asher Anochi Mitzvah Eschem Hayom, uh, that I command you today, same point Rashi makes as the first paragraph, that there should be a freshness and an excitement when we do God's mitzvot. <clears throat> and, of course, we again refer back to this idea of loving God. Rav Schwab has a fascinating thought. Rav Schwab says, if we do all the mitzvot the way we're supposed to do them, if we really do them the right way, when, with open hearts and minds and things like that, we will love God. Inherently, we'll look. Again, we're not just talking about the rules now. We're talking about a whole life holistic approach. But, but if we're doing what God tells us to do, it'll, it'll, it'll build us in a certain way. So to love Hashem, your God, and to serve Him. What does it mean to serve Him? How do you serve God with your heart? So Rashi says, we have this famous idea of Avodah Shebelev. Mm -hmm. Service of the heart. And what's Avodah Shebelev? Prayer. Mm -hmm. So according to this, here it is in the, in the second paragraph of Shema. It's talking specifically about the importance of loving God and of praying to God. And to pray to God with all of your heart, with, with, with focus, and with all of your soul. What does that mean to, to, to pray to God with all of your, your soul? What does that I mean? Levavchem is your heart, how you think. So Rav Schwab, if people remember from the Shemona Esri series, Rav Schwab had a very interesting idea where he spoke about the bracha of Ritzay. And, you know, so we, we just got finished with all these different requests. And then after the, whole, the, the last bracha of the request section is God who listens to prayers. And the first bracha is God, find favor in our prayers. So that sounds like, like postscript. Rav Schwab says it's a whole different thing. And by the way, we don't consider that a request. You know, it sounds like we consider that a request. It sounds like a request. Schwab says the pshat is that we say to God, we hope that, not because he'll give us something good if, if he likes our prayers. We, we, we hope he finds our prayers appropriate. We hope he has nachas from us. We, we hope almost as if for his sake. You know, we, we hope we're doing good. We hope we're doing things the right way. So he suggests that that's the idea of serving God. Notice, la'abdo b'chol levavchem is to serve him with all of your heart, passionate relationship with God. Not even for me. Not even, not even because it is meaningful for me or it's not meaningful for me. Just, you know, God put me on this world. I, I hope he looks at me and, and feels that he's put, put me on this world for a good reason. And that I'm, and that I'm doing good. That I'm doing appropriate things. That's how he suggests the possible it's an interesting idea. Okay. So, if you're serving God and you love God and you're doing what you're supposed to do, then what will happen Vinosati, Mitar Artsachem Bi Ito, Yorel Malkosh, I will give the rain of your land at its appropriate time and the different grain seasons and grapes, it'll all come at the right times. And you'll gather these different crops at the appropriate times. There's by the way a very famous Rashi over here. I will give the rain of your land at its time. This is considered another layer to the bracha, to the blessing. That God says, when it, when it rains, it'll rain at a time that, uh, that's convenient for you. So uh, the famous quote that Rashi says is, you know, like on Friday night. 
<laughs> presumably it means after you've come home from shul. <laughs> And presumably it's a night where there's no shalom zachers, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the uh, that's the idea that it's that it's like that it's the bracha is 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 like not only will you get the bottom line that you're looking for, but but it'll come in, in the most convenient of ways. Vinosati esev besat chalivam techa. By the way, it's not only that you'll have crops to eat from. I'll give grass in your field to your animals. <clears throat> and you'll eat and you'll become satiated. Rashi says there's another layer of bracha here. So we were talking about the bracha of rain. We are talking about the bracha not only of having rain, but having rain at an opportune time. Now, when one has food to eat, the first bracha is that one has food. The second bracha is what the Gemara describes as bracha besoch ha-meyayim, a blessing within one's digestive system. That uh, it's one's blessed that uh, one should be satiated by what one has. I'll, I'll give the modern day version of it. The modern day version of it is, we of course ask God that everything should be well with us financially. So that presumably comes out to some amount of income per year. But a person could have a certain amount of income and could find him or herself spending it on a number of unexpected expenses. right? And then another person could have much less income, but things just seem to work out. You know, and then the car stays well, and uh, thank God the roof doesn't have to be replaced, and et cetera. So that, that would be the modern day version of, of not only bracha of the grains, but bracha, let's say, within one's own, you know, what, that one, what one has goes a long way. That, that seems to be part of the idea here. I mean, so we can appreciate it in our society too. I just want to go a little bit further before. Thank you very much. Hisham um, Rulochem. So this is such a, a positive. You're doing the mitzvahs, you're loving God, all these brachos are coming, everything at the right time. Great. Be careful. Maybe your hearts will become seduced. It's very interesting, by the way, the same levavchem by which we're, with which we're charged to serve God, the same levavchem with which we're charged to love God, maybe our hearts will be seduced. And we'll turn away. And you'll serve other gods. And you'll bow down to them. And Rashi says here the famous idea, which is really borne out by numerous psukim in the final book of the Chumash, that one of the greatest dangers in life is success. And uh, if, one, if, one, if things go very well for one in the field, the very bracha that God was just talking about, that creates its own challenges. So now that we've spoken about the blessings of the field, be careful, lest the blessings of the field make your heart turn away because you begin to convince yourself that the blessings are thanks to you, thanks to your effort. And, and sometimes it's easier to see God and to see our, our connection with God when we need things. And when we have things, sometimes it's, it's, it's harder to see it. It's more of a challenge. Um, it's interesting. Rashi also says over here, the second half of the verse, and you'll turn away and you'll serve other gods. He said... There's a big comma between those two things. The first step is just turning away. The first step is taking interest in things other than God and his approach to life. Once one does that, there's a, a slippery slope that might go all the way to, to worshiping idols. But the point is, it's not, we're not talking about, you know, be careful, one day you'll be so happy that you did well in the field, and so then you'll, you know, do a vodazar that afternoon. That's not the point. The point is that you'll, you'll, you'll lose your focus of things. Who knows how far, how far that could go. Um, and it's also interesting to think about, I mean, the Gemara famously talks about that we don't begin to understand a temptation for a Vodazara, for idol worship. I mean, it's, it's, it's totally beyond us. But um, it's interesting, you know, sometimes people, whether they're talking about this verse, whether they're talking about other verses, uh, we, we have our own, I don't know if we would call them a Vodazara technically, but we have our own very tempting pursuits in this world today uh, that, that people sometimes fall prey to. Uh, we all know people who fall prey to their own, their own pursuit of excellence, success, fame, wealth, whatever it is that it takes on a life of its own. Uh, I, I, don't, I want to be clear. I, I don't mean that in some heavily religious way. I mean, I'm just I'm saying, you know, we just look at the world. I, you know, not looking at it through religious glasses, I think we would say the same thing. And so this is it's one of the greatest blessings that we have 
from this very holistic Torah lifestyle that if we approach it in the right way, there's tremendous balance. And uh, heaven forbid, and again, and, and, and success can be quite intoxicating. And so God tells us, be careful that if, if, we, uh, if we're too successful, there's nothing wrong with being too successful, but, uh, but just be, be more cautious about losing focus of other things. Um, okay, let's keep on going. And God will become angry at you. And then he'll stop the heavens. And there won't be rain. And the ground, the ground will not give its crap. And you will be destroyed very quickly from the good land which God gave to you, which God gives to you. You'll be exiled from the land of Israel, and that'll be a, a great tragedy. It's interesting, Rashi brings down the question, you'll be exiled quickly, meaning, you know, once, again, remember the Ramban, this is talking on a national level, the Jews as a whole really, really lose focus of what's what. Then they'll be exiled quickly. So Rashi brings down the question, gosh, even the people of the flood, they had a lot of time. They, God gave them all these years and Noah was supposed to be building the ark. You know, is, is, is the picture in these psukim worse than the people of the flood? That God specifically says, you'll, you'll be lost very quickly. So it's very interesting. So the answer which Rashi brings down is the people of the flood didn't have anybody to teach them. So, you know, you know okay, so God creates Noah as a role model. But this was like a new phenomenon. We have, we have a Torah. We, we have a, a way of life that we're supposed to be living. And if, if we, as a people, turn away from that, uh, there's not a lot of tolerance for that. Maybe we'll, we'll pause now for comments or questions and then reading. Very interesting that there's interplay between the singular and the plural in this paragraph, where you're, on the one hand, you're saying you know, that if you do all of these things, then you'll be rewarded. But on the other hand, uh, uh, but then it becomes very personal. All of that becomes very singular. Yeah, th there are different, thank you for raising that. I, I, forgive me for not having raised it. Thank you very much. There are, <coughs> there are different approaches to this. Uh, one approach that I saw is that not everyone, for example, is a farmer. So in other words, so, so when, in terms of if you're doing the will of God, that's the big national, if you, the, if you, the plural. Um, not everyone is going to be gathering their crops. <coughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? So, so that specific individuals will be gathering their crops. Um, I believe I once saw, I mean, there's not, that, that's not the only single form here, but it, it, it flows through. I believe I once saw an approach, though I, I might be making this up as I go along, but I think I once saw an approach that when we're talking about receiving things from God, even if everyone is receiving it, it feels like, like the excitement is something that's like, I feel like I personally am getting something, something like that. But uh, it, is, it is a very interesting point, that, that flow between plural and singular. But then it goes right back to Right, because that's back to, that's then back to mitzvah observance. And the mitzvah observance was you know, that's the plural, if you listen right. to my mitzvot, b'chol avchem, b'chol avshechem, with all of your hearts, with all of your souls. Um, also in the, in, the, in the plural, it seemed the reward went into the singular. Now but back to the, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, so it shifts back to the plural. Yeah. Which, by the way, speaks to an interesting idea also, that it seems that the experience of doing good things, or heaven forbid, doing inappropriate things, is like a whole different experience when it's part of a group. It's an interesting thing to think about that. Uh, Nancy? I, I want to comment that many times I think of the psychological implications of some of the words. Like, the um, of the that you shall be satisfied when you eat. Um, you don't have to even have an eating disorder mm -hmm. to have times when a tiny bit of something will satisfy you. Partly because you, in, it's your mind. It's, you know, you're very satisfied by this little bit of something, and then other times you just you, you keep on eating and eating and eating, yeah. very often for psychological or yeah. other reasons, not for actual hunger. Um, there's also, I also feel that the um, Avodah Zara, 
is sometimes also a psychological thing. In other words, if you forget that Hashem gave you the power, or gave you the power, or, that, or gave you money, essentially, right. uh, or the ability to do this, and it's really all his to, to give to who he feels deserves it, um, then in a way it's about a zara because it's your arrogance, you're egotistical. You think, sure. gee, I did this by myself. And there's a certain worth of self, ego, you know, narcissism mm -hmm. or egocentric. So I think there's psychological implications sure. to some of these words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe one more, Dr. Shines. Well, a, a quick note before I ask my question. The uh, of punning and satisfying Rabbi Kohanim is mm -hmm. definitely psychological. But as far as having a famine, not having rain, and having to leave her to Israel, Rabbi Kohanim Yaakov. So that's interesting. I mean, that, that's an interesting thing. I mean, th th let's say the Ram, you could say that part of this is, is foreshadowing for future generations. We were talking about that a little bit Shabbos afternoon, even the foreshadowing for future generations. Um, with the Ramban's model, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, but it is, it's interesting to think about. Uh, again, that's a classic example. That's not to say that every time a person has challenges in life, it's worth repeating. It's not to say that when people have challenges in life, it must be they did something wrong. I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times I'm asked that question. Uh, how many times a person says to me, you know, something happened and I have no idea why it would happen and I ask myself what I did wrong. It's, very, it's a very commonly said thing. Hashem um, is testing you. So, it's, so there's, oh, there's a number of possibilities. So it's always important to remember there's a number of possibilities. It never hurts to ask oneself if there's a possible lesson here. I mean, worse comes to worse. That's not the reason it happened. You still improved. That's it's fine, uh, but but there's numerous uh, there's numerous things. It doesn't have to be that we're being punished. This is on a national level, and I, I repeat what the Ramban said. The Ramban says even that it's where it's extremes, where it's great piety or, or great wickedness. That's what we're talking about here. Um, but uh, many times, um, listen, much much of what we're talking about in these psukim of loving God, of seeing, of of, of serving God is to see the hand of God in this world. And a person can see the hand of God without assuming that it must be I'm a terrible person and God is punishing me. Uh, we, can, we can definitely have insight into experiences and, and that is, it behooves us to do so. Okay, but we'll keep on going. The hand of God is fine, but the hand of the clock also speaks. Okay. Um, What's that saying, we gotta finish? It's saying we gotta get moving. Um, this I'm, I'm uh, you know, around three quarters of the way down the page in 92. Now, Rashi says that there's a, there's a very powerful point being conveyed here in the Pasuk. So, back to context, we just spoke about if you don't fulfill the will of God, you'll be exiled from the land. And now the very next Pasuk says, and place these words on your souls, on your hearts and on your souls, Ukshartem Osam Lios Ayatchem, Vayulatotafos Bain Echem. And again it makes reference to the Tfilin. And Rashi says what this means is even after you've been exiled from God's holy land, you still need to make the mitzvahs of your life. Now, again, that's that's elementary to us, because we get it. We are living in the diaspora now and the mitzvahs are part of our lives. But, but if you're looking at it from a fresh perspective, it's actually a fascinating statement. God, you bring us the land of Israel to serve you and to do all these things that you want us to do and all that, and then you look at us and you're not impressed, so you exile us. So, okay, you exiled us, so I guess, I guess it's over. You know, if you want us back, you'll give us a call. But, but, the, but the point here is not that way. The point is that even, even when we get exiled, there's still this way that we're supposed to lead life and it's still with the hope and the expectation and the yearning that will ultimately be brought back and that God is watching us and interested enough in us the whole time. Uh, by the way, I, 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 I don't think I wrote it down, but I, I, I believe it was on the previous Pasuk, that, that which God, God says you'll, you'll be, the, you'll be you're driven out of the land which I give to you. Driven out of the land which I give to you, driven out of the land which I gave to you. So they say that the pshat is, I think it's on this puzzle, they say that the pshat is that even as you're being driven out, it's still in the present tense because this is, this is your land. You're just, you're just going away for a while.
but you'll ultimately come back. It's an interesting way to, to think about things. Um, okay. V'limadatem osam es b'neichem l'daber bam. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's an iron. It's interesting in terms of your point before. Here, it's it's really, really teaching. Yeah. <laughs> you should teach your children, which doesn't take away from what you were saying before. The the truth is, one of the points made in the in the difference between the first paragraph and the second paragraph is vishinantam. The Gemara says vishinantam is a language of sharpness, uh, and that that seems to be a little more, let's say, pedagogical. You know, it's kind of you know terse. You know, uh, I don't mean that in a negative way, terse, you know, but bite-sized messages and, you know, keep on drilling and reviewing. And Vlimadatem um, could be a little bit more, even more like what you were referring to before. It's possible, you know, you know but it's, uh, you know, to teach, to, 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 to make them understand, to make them appreciate, which, again, it's fascinating to think about that in the model of the Jews in exile, that as you're sitting there in exile, this is the time where you really need uh, to, to bring it home in, in a very, you know, they're not, they don't have a temple to look at. You know, it's, it, you've got you've to create these ideas for them. You should teach these words to your children to speak in them. Extremely powerful point. A number of commentators point this out. In the previous paragraph it was you should teach your children and you should speak about these words of Torah. Which very much seems to be modeling, by the way. You know, modeling in terms of Torah study, Linda, but you know, but modeling nonetheless. Teach it to your children in a way that they'll speak about the words of Torah. The mode of your teaching, it's an interesting thing to think about. I see a number of educators in the room. It's an interesting thing to think about that part of the goal of education is not only the conveying of material, but to convey in a way that they themselves will have a, a fire and a vigor to continue to, to study the subject on their own. I think that seems to be part of the point here. Um, as you sit in your house, as you walk on the path, as you lie down, as you rise up. Again, the same phrasing that we had in the previous paragraph. And you should write them on the posts of your door and your gates. What an interesting wrap around that we do at the end of this paragraph. So, I mean, like, if you mapped out the paragraph, the first part of the paragraph is, if you, know, if you do good things, you'll get great blessings from God. If you do, second part of the paragraph, if you do bad things, he's going to throw you out of his realm. Third part of the paragraph, and make sure to teach your children about this. So we could have ended. Now, we end off, you should do all of this. You should, you should reflect on these ideas. You should teach your children so that your days and your children's days will be many. On the land which God swore to your fathers to give to them, like the days of the heaven over the earth. So in other words, the point is we wrap around, again, and this is the end of the second paragraph, we wrap around and we, uh, we wrap around, uh, we wrap around, we wrap around and we say that the reason why I need to think about all this is that I just spend a lot of time in Israel. As long as you, as you internalize this message, you'll be fine. Um, there's, a, there's a very famous quote from Chazal here. Uh, there are numerous places where there are allusions to the revival of the dead. So this is an example. That God swore to your fathers, meaning like the patriarchs, to give them. What do you mean to give them? The patriarchs, I mean, the, it was the descendants that got the land of Israel. So the answer is the day will come where everyone will be back. The, the, the famous idea. Um, it's a very interesting phrase, like the days of heaven over the earth. So it seems the most standard way to understand the phrase is the same, count the number of days that the skies cover the earth. It's always, that's, that's how the world is. It's constant, it's eternal. So that hopefully will be the amount of time that, you're, that you and your nation spend in the land of Israel. You know, like, like, the, like the sky covers the earth, that should be how you live in the land of Israel. That seems to be the most standard way to understand the phrasing. Uh, we'll open up to some comments, questions. <coughs> Mr. Hornstein.
Yeah, um, we had this phrase of Shach of Kulecha twice. We talked about the things that repeat. The simplest way to interpret that, and it seems very, very uh, sublime, is you should start your day 